Greetings students and welcome back to another lesson on complex variables. In this video we're going to discuss and prove the argument principle. This shouldn't be confused with the argument principle of internet forums which states that the person who comes up with the most ad hominem attacks wins the argument. Instead the argument principle in complex variables is related to the argument of a complex number which I defined in a previous video. Let's say that we have a positively oriented simple closed contour C. By closed I mean that the contour completely encloses an area and by simple I mean that the contour doesn't cross itself. Let's also say that f of z is a meromorphic function inside c and that it's analytic and non-zero on c. So it's meromorphic inside c but it has no zeros and no poles on the curve c. Finally suppose that capital Z and P represent the number of zeros and poles of f of z inside c respectively. I'll explain later what it means when it says counting multiplicities and orders. If all these assumptions are true then the winding number of f of z as we traverse the image of the curve c is equal to the number of zeros of f of z inside c minus the number of poles of f of z inside c, counting multiplicities and orders of course. We'll start the proof by looking at the integral over c of f prime z over f of z. To perform this integral we'll use a parametric representation of c with the parameter t, such that the curve c is represented by z of t, where t is a real parameter that runs from a to b. The limits on t, the a and the b, are selected such that as t goes from a to b, the complex number z encircles the closed contour c exactly once. Now using this parametric representation, our integral in z becomes an integral in t from a to b. Note that the z prime t is there because in order to convert dz to dt, we have to use the chain rule where dz is dz over dt or z prime t times dt. As we've discussed before, when we take the complex number z that's parametrized by t and run it through a function f, we get another complex number w which is also dependent on t. And just as the complex number z has a polar representation, so too does the complex number w. I'll write the polar representation of w as rho times the exponential of i times phi. In general, because z depends on the parameter t, w also depends on the parameter t such that in the polar representation w can be written as rho of t times the exponential of i times phi of t. And because w is just a function of z, we can write f of z as this polar representation of w. I'll call this equation A. Let's go back up to our integral and put this numerator in terms of rho and phi. We can write the f prime as df by dz and we can write the z prime as dz by dt. Once we do that we can use the chain rule to write the whole numerator as df by dt. Using equation A, I can differentiate f with respect to t quite easily. I'll get rho prime of t times the exponential of i times phi plus i times rho of t times phi prime of t times the exponential of i times phi. If we plug this back into our integral, here's what we'll get. Note that I've replaced the f of z in the denominator by an expression involving rho and phi that I got from equation A. We can then split up the numerator and get two integrals as follows. And after we cancel the common terms, we finally end up with these two relatively simple integrals. The first integral is just the natural log of rho of t, and the second integral is just i times phi of t. Of course, the limits of a and b still apply. Now recall that the limits a and b were chosen such that as t went from a to b, we went around the closed contour c exactly once. And because we go around exactly once, we end up at the same place on c that we started at which means that if we go through the function w equals f of z, we will end up at the same point on the w plane that we started at. So if we started at w naught equals f of z naught, then as we go around the curve c, we'll end up back at z naught, and so therefore we will end up back at w naught. In general, this new w naught point will have a different argument. It's going to be shifted by some multiple of 2 pi. However, its distance from the origin when t equals b will be the same as its distance from the origin when t equals a, obviously because it's the same point that we end back up at. Therefore, rho of a equals rho of b, and we can cancel the contribution of the natural log, leaving us with phi of b minus phi of a as the answer to our integral. 
But phi of b minus phi of a is actually related to the winding number. It's the change in the argument of f of z as we make a full traversal of the closed contour c. We discussed this in a previous video where I defined the winding number. So in conclusion, the integral over the closed curve c of f prime of z over f of z is i times the change with respect to the contour c of the argument of f of z. I'm going to call this equation 1. Now the integral on the left hand side of equation 1 can be evaluated using a second method. Let me show you how. If we go back to the assumptions of this theorem, then f of z is analytic and non-zero on the contour c, but it's meromorphic inside the contour c. We'll suppose that f of z has n zeros inside the contour c that I'll denote by zi, where i is an index from 1 to n. Note that i over here is an index and not the imaginary number. I couldn't really use other letters because I was running out, so unfortunately I had to go with i even though it's a bit confusing with the notation. We'll also suppose that f has p poles inside the contour c that I'll denote by zj, where j varies from 1 to p. Remember, we're allowed to have poles inside the contour because f of z is meromorphic inside the contour, so it has a finite number of discontinuities inside, but we can't have poles on the contour. Let's start by considering the i at 0 of f of z, zi. If f has a 0 at zi, then we can take out the contribution of zi as a factor of z minus zi, and write f as the following. Now in general, the factor z minus zi that's making f 0 at zi appears mi times in f. It doesn't necessarily appear just once. If we completely take it out of f, we'll be left with a function g of z that no longer has zeros at zi because we've fully taken away the contribution of zi to making f0. By the way, this mi is called the multiplicity of the zero zi. Now if we differentiate this f of z that's written in terms of zi, here's what we'll get using the product rule. And if we take the ratio f prime of z over f of z, when they're expressed in terms of zi, we'll get mi over z minus zi plus g prime z over g of z after simplification. I'll call this equation b. Since g prime of z and g of z contain no zeros at zi, this ratio doesn't matter when it comes to determining the residue of f prime z over f of z at zi. Therefore, it should be easy to conclude that f prime z over f of z has a residue at zi equal to the multiplicity of zi in the function f of z, which is just mi. mi is the coefficient of z minus zi to the negative 1 in f prime z over f of z. Therefore, it's the residue of f prime z over f of z at zi by definition. In the same vein, let's consider the jth pole of f of z, zj. If f has a pole at zj, then we can take out the contribution of zj as a factor of z minus zj from the denominator, and write f as the following. Now in general, the factor z minus zj that's acting as the pole of f at zj appears kj times in f. It doesn't necessarily appear just once. If we completely take it out of f, we'll be left with the function h of z that no longer has poles at zj because we've fully taken away the contribution of zj as a pole. By the way, this kj is called the order of the pole zj. Next, if we differentiate this f of z that's written in terms of zj, here's what we'll get using the product rule. And if we take the ratio f prime z over f of z when they're expressed in terms of zj, we'll get negative kj over z minus zj plus h prime z over h of z after simplification. I'll call this equation c. Since h prime of z and h of z contain no zeros or poles at zj, this ratio doesn't matter when it comes to determining the residue of f prime z over f of z at zj. Therefore, it should be easy to conclude that f prime z over f of z has a residue at zj equal to the negative of the order of the pole zj in the function f of z, which is just negative kj. Negative kj is the coefficient of z minus zj to the negative 1. Therefore, it's the residue of f prime z over f of z at zj by definition. Now, when we perform the integration of f prime z over f of z over the contour c, we can use the residue theorem to say that this integral is equal to 2 pi i times the sum of the residues of f prime z over f of z. 
And in order to evaluate the sum of the residues, we'll need to add all the residues due to the contributions of the zeros of f inside the contour c. This means we'll need to add all the residues corresponding to the zeros of f of z, which means that we'll need to add all the multiplicities mi of the n zeros. In addition, we'll need to add all the residues due to the contribution of the poles of f of z inside the contour c, which means we'll need to add all the negative kj's of the p poles. Therefore, the total sum of the residues of f prime z over f of z inside the contour c can be written as the sum from i equals 1 to n of mi minus the sum from j equals 1 to p of kj. I'll denote the first summation by capital Z, which is the number of zeros of f inside the contour C, counting multiplicities. So I'm adding the multiplicities of all the zeros together. In addition, I'll denote the second summation by P, which is the number of poles of f inside the contour C, counting the orders. So I'm adding the orders of all the poles together. So the integral of f prime Z over f of Z over the closed contour C is 2 pi i times capital Z minus P. I'll call this equation two. Now if I go up to equation one, then you can see that the left-hand sides of both equations one and two are equal. This means that the right-hand sides must be equal by the transitive property, which means that I times the change in the argument of F of Z with respect to the traversal of the curve C equals two pi i times capital Z minus P. If we simplify this, we'll finally end up with capital Z minus P equaling the winding number of F of Z as we traverse the curve C, where capital Z and P are the zeros and poles of F of Z inside the curve C, counting multiplicities and orders. And this is what we needed to prove the argument principle. So that's it. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher. And if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan signing out.